Welcome everybody and thank you for coming today to listen to our presentation. Our project is fabricating and characterizing polymers for biomedical devices. My name is Crystal Ann. I'm Jessica Fan. I'm Karen Yu. I'm Sir Barry Sirkar. I'm Jake Walsh. Throughout the four weeks of our research, we found that the processes of drawing and annealing improved the mechanical properties of poly-L-lactic acid. So to begin our presentation today, we will start by reviewing some background information regarding biomaterials, polymers, characterization techniques, and information specific to poly lactic acid. Following that, we will go into more detail regarding our experimental procedure, covering the fabrication process, and then the characterization techniques that were used. Then we will go on to explain the results of our experiment and go over the, uh, and present the data that we collected through our research. Following that, we will move on to our conclusion section, where we will explain our major findings and their applications to the biomedical field. Finally, we would like to acknowledge some special contributors to our project. Okay, so biomaterials are non-living materials that are implemented in the body in order to aid to repair or replace damaged body parts. There are numerous applications of biomaterials in the field of biomedical engineering, such as in devices that control drug delivery, sutures to seal stitches, stents and vascular grafts, as shown in this image right here, and in bone screws to heal injuries. As such, improving the strength, flexibility, and biocompatibility of biomaterials are three major goals in the future of biomedical engineering. Polymers are large molecules made of small repeating units called monomers. They are usually used in biomedical devices for their flexibility and stability, but have several other properties that determine their degree of strength as well. These properties are the focus of our research, and they include the glass transitional temperature, tensile strength, crystallinity, and orientation. The glass transition temperature is the point at which the transition between the glassy and rubbery states occur in amorphous regions. Tensile strength is a measure of a polymer's resistance to deformation by stretching. Crystallinity refers to the structural order within a polymer, and finally, orientation refers to the alignment of polymer chains within a fiber. If a polymer has both strong crystallinity and orientation, then it becomes stronger and is therefore better applicable to biomedical devices. So the biomaterial we used in our project was polylactic acid, which is a polymer of lactic acid. Lactic acid may be used to produce two molecules, D-lactide and L-lactide. Poly-L-lactic acid, or PLLA, is a polymer of L-lactide, and it is very popular in consumer applications due to its biodegradability, as well as its renewability as a resource. In this project, our goal was to improve the tensile strength of PLLA. We used several different characterization techniques to determine the properties of the PLLA. First, we used differential scanning calorimetry, or DSC, to measure the behavior of the PLLA in heating and cooling. Next, we used the mechanical testing system, or MTS, shown in the image here, to measure the tensile strength of the PLLA fibers. We also used X-ray diffraction, or XRD, to measure the percent crystallinity of the PLLA. Finally, we used the draw ratio to see how much the fibers were able to stretch during drawing. So here's a brief experimental overview. Um, as you see in the top left-hand corner of the screen, we began with PLLA as pellets, and then we processed them in two different ways. The first way was differential scanning calorimetry, or DSC, from which we learned the melting temperature and the crystallization temperature of PLLA. Then going back to pellets, we also dried the pellets, and then using the melting temperature, we extruded them into fibers. We then processed these fibers in two different ways, which were drawing and annealing. For annealing, we had to know the crystallization temperature of PLLA, which we had learned from DSC. Then, after we had drawn the fibers, we tested the drawn and the undrawn fibers using the mechanical testing system. Finally, we used X-ray diffraction analysis, or XRD, to analyze all the fibers that we had produced, including drawn fibers, undrawn fibers, and annealed fibers. Differential scanning calorimetry, or DSC, the first characterization technique that we use, essentially consists of heating, cooling, and then reheating a sample, all the while recording the amount of energy the sample emits relative to a given standard. Through this, the temperatures in which various phase transitions in the sample occur can be determined by the analysis of exothermic peaks and endothermic valleys in the sample's DSC scanning curve. In this PLLA DSC scan, one sees in red the initial heating, in blue the subsequent cooling, and in green the final reheating. And red when first in the Greek heating curve, one first sees a small dip that corresponds to the glass transition, followed by a very large dip that corresponds to its first melting. 
Then in blue, as it goes right to the left chronologically, the uh, PLA goes from a molten slurry to an elastomeric putty-like substance, followed by going once again through the glass transition. In green, it goes through a two-stage glass transition, followed by its first crystallization of approximately 130 degrees Celsius, followed by its remelting at approximately 170 degrees Celsius. The melting temperature is critical to the polymer's extrusion, while the crystallization temperature is necessary for its drawing. So the process we used to fabricate the fibers was extrusion. Extrusion in general is used to create objects that have a consistent cross-section throughout its entire length. In our experiment, we first dried PLLA pellets and then packed it into a rheometer, shown in this image here, and the rheometer heated the pellets until they melted. It was, the melt was then pushed through a die, which is a hole at the bottom of the rheometer, and the end of the fiber was then attached to a spool, which is shown on the image on the right. The spool was then spun at different speeds in order to create fibers with different thicknesses. We implemented the drawing process in our project in order to determine its effects on PLA strength. The PLA fibers were drawn across the hot plate, shown in this figure, at temperatures of 110 and 120 degrees Celsius. The drawn fibers were several times their initial length. Another process we used to treat the fibers was annealing. Annealing is the heating and slow cooling of a substance to enable crystallization. We annealed both drawn and undrawn fibers at 150 degrees Celsius for 19 hours. After we removed the fibers from the heat, we noticed that the undrawn fiber had become brittle and opaque, while the drawn fiber remained translucent. Following some myriad improvements, we used a mechanical testing system, or MTS, to evaluate the various tensile properties of the fibers. So the MTS essentially consists of two clamps between which a PLA fiber is placed. And these clamps can gradually pull the PLA fiber apart, and a stress-strain curve is uh, constructed by using preemptively measured parameters such as the diameter of the fiber, which is recorded using a micrometer. In this series of stress strain curves for undrawn PLA fibers, one sees three primary regions demarcated by four points, B, M, Y, and F. The first region from B to M is the elastic region, in which the slope is linear and is equivalent to the Young's modulus of the fiber, which is the ratio of stress to strain. Following this, there is the viscoelastic region from M to Y, in which deformation is partially recoverable and the fiber begins to undergo creep, in which strain increases even while stress remains constant. Following this, after yielding at point Y, from Y to F, the fiber undergoes plastic deformation, in which deformation is entirely non-recoverable, and this continues until the fiber ultimately breaks at its failure point, F. So, as you can see, these are the MTS findings. We tested for the mean Young's modulus, mean strain at yield, and mean stress at yield, for undrawn fibers and fibers drawn at 110 and 120 degrees Celsius. The drawn fibers had higher values for all three tests than undrawn fibers, so this means that they were more resistant to deformation and had higher tensile strength. Furthermore, fibers that were drawn at 110 degrees Celsius had higher values for the tests than the fibers drawn at 120 degrees Celsius, implying that there is an ideal temperature range for drawing the fibers. The, vi the fibers should be drawn at a temperature so that the molecules in the material may be heated to a crystalline phase, but do not enter an amorphous phase. If fibers are drawn at a correct, experimentally determined temperature, then they may be produced with optimal characteristics. So after MTS analysis, we formed X-ray diffraction, or XRD. In X-ray diffraction, a sample is placed on the sample holder, and then an X-ray beam is sent to the sample. The sample will diffract the uh, X-ray beams in a characteristic pattern, and depending on what kind of diffraction pattern is picked up by the detector, we can determine the crystalline structure of the sample that was placed in the sample holder. So on this slide, we have several examples of X-ray detector images, which are very helpful in visually representing XRD data. In the images, the brighter areas correspond to a higher number of counts, which are the number of photons that are reflected from the sample from the X-ray beam. Depending on the different molecular structures of the samples, the X-ray detector images will show different features. The two main features that are observable in these images are first, a broad fuzzy arc, such as the one seen in figure A, and sharp distinct arcs, such as those seen in figure D. Figure A is representative of a non-crystalline structure, whereas figure D is representative of a crystalline structure. Another characteristic that can be determined from these images is the angling of the arcs and arc, arc segments. For example, in figure A, we see that the arc is equally distributed about the center and therefore represents an unoriented sample. 
in figure D, we see that the arc and arc segments are unequally distributed about the center and are actually set at an angle. So this means they come from an oriented sample. So in this series of four images, we can very nicely see the, how our tested processes of drawing and wheeling affected the molecular structure of PLA. In figure A, we start off with a fiber that is both undrawn and unannealed, and we see that its structure is clearly amorphous and unoriented. In figure B, we've isolated the effects of annealing upon an undrawn fiber, and we see that this process increases the crystallinity of the structure. In figure C, we have isolated the effects of drawing upon an unannealed fiber. We see that this process increases both the crystallinity and the orientation, but only to a certain extent. In the final figure, we have a fiber that has been both drawn and annealed. We see that this combination of processes results in a significant improvement in both crystallinity and orientation. So through fabricating and characterizing PLA, we have concluded that it is an extremely versatile polymer that has the potential to be used in many different biomedical devices due to its biodegradability and ease of processability. Through the simple process of drawing, we were able to greatly increase the mechanical properties and strength of the PLLA. We have also found that both drawing and annealing improve the crystallinity and orientation of PLLA, although annealing only improves orientation in fibers that have been previously drawn. While our research focused mainly on the process properties of the fibers themselves, we believe that in future research, it may be beneficial to explore how the fibers behave within structures, such as sutures, stents, or nerve conduits. And now we'd like to make some acknowledgments. First, we'd like to thank our project mentors, Dr. Ng and Dr. Murphy, for helping us in the lab to produce fibers and to analyze their various properties, as well as to analyze all the data that we collected at the lab. We'd additionally like to thank Dr. Murphy's lab assistant, Sid, for also helping us in the lab to extrude and characterize the fibers. We'd like to thank our project RTA Julie for being for, here for us throughout the course of the project and helping us to construct both this presentation and our final research paper. Um, we'd also like to thank the directors of the Governor's School of Engineering and Technology, Dr. Rosen and Dean Antoine, for helping to make Governor's School possible. Um, additionally, we'd like to thank Sarah Spraka and Pirac Pharmaceuticals for donating the PLLA that we analyzed in this project. And lastly, we'd like to thank the sponsors of GSET, which are listed below, um, for helping to, us to be here today. Um, so these are the references for the images that we used throughout the course of this presentation. Um, we hope you enjoyed the presentation, and we would now like to open the floor for questions. Essentially, crystallinity adds uh, more regularity to the structure of the fiber, and so more uh, strength, and more energy is required to break those uh, crystalline bonds in the, within the fiber. So more energy is required to store it and deform it. Do you make sure it's not too brittle? Um, so there is a trade-off between crystallinity and orientation. Um, as uh, as I think Jessica mentioned, the fibers that we annealed that were undrawn were unoriented, so they did have a brittle structure since they were simply crystalline and not oriented. However, when we did draw the fibers beforehand, they had an orientation to them, so the crystals were formed in an orderly manner, and that way the crystallinity was also providing strength rather than, uh, rather than brittleness. Did you also investigate, you investigated the temperature that you drew it at, did you also investigate different rates of annealing? Uh, no, unfortunately. Part of the uh, future routes that we'd like to take for future research. Any further questions? Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.